In 2022, the Miyu Mini dominated the budget bracket of handhelds. Ambenix Ugly, yet capable 353 VS was not too far behind, and today we're going to look at their latest $50 handheld. Is it worth its price point, or have they lost the plot? Welcome to Team Pandori. Like, subscribe and bell! So this bag came. Magic! And it's wrapped very well in two layers of air bubbles. And we just take a look at this. Squeaky clean. There's like no information on any side other than this one. Nice. As we can see here, it's very bare bones. And the handheld sits in this plastic egg carton. We've got some cleaning wipes. It's for the screen protector. A manual in both English and Chinese. Hamni Samni Da. I am John Lu. Space pin. We got a screen protector. If you look in the box at the end of the case, there is a USB A to USB C charging cable. Let's unsheath the beast. There's a plastic cover to protect the buttons. And here it is. That looks pretty good. They copied the Miu Mini and you know it. We have a three and a half inch IPS panel with a resolution at 640 by 480. There's a D-pad, start and select, four front buttons, a menu nipple and a mono speaker. On the top there's a mini HDMI. On the bottom we have a jack for headphones and a USB-C port for charging. On the left side we have a volume rocker, plus and minus. And on the right side we have two micro SD slots and currently only one is populated. Above that we have a reset and power button. On the back we have four shoulder buttons, two L's and two R's. Yar. We can see the battery and the circuitry through the case, but to access we'll need a security bit. Ambenic are well known for packing the products with generic, non-reliable micro SD cards, and this one here is no exception. As we can see in plain sight, this card has 64 munchkins of space. Moving on to controls, the D-pad is quite squishy, much softer than the regular Ambenic device. The buttons are like nipples on a cold day. They stick out a little too much, but they have a nice tactile feel. And here are the shoulder buttons. Very similar to the 353V, but are smaller and rattle less. In the hands this is pretty comfortable, but accessing the shoulder buttons may be difficult for some. It's about time for the size comparison. Here's the RG353VS. Same as the 353V with these two analog sticks. The Game Boy Pocket. The original Game Boy. Everyone's nemesis, the MiU Mini. And the Roy Bosch tea bag. Let's see how long this takes to boot up. And that is pretty quick. Here's the main menu. We can see they replicated the one from the Mia Mini outside the annoying sounds. Thankfully we can turn these off in the settings screen. There's not much to play with here. There is an IO test so we can test out the controls. We can turn off the button sound. And we can change the theme. We can change the image in the background. Language settings. And not much else. When choosing a game to play, we're given the systems that it can run, and from that, we can select our game. There's a list of 17 system types here, with a favorites list, and a simple search function. So let's try out a game. Not off to a good start here. Tekken 3 has noticeable audio delay, but it is running at full speed. You can get to the in-game menu by pressing the menu button, where you can load and save state, reset the game, change video filters, brightness, and a few more options. Here are the video filters in action. To see what they do more clearly, we use Kirby for the Game Boy Advance. Kirby sucks. Anyway, back to the PlayStation. In Tomb Raider, there is no audio delay, but there is a slight problem with the video aspect ratio. And it's a bit of Gran Turismo. As expected, NES runs fine.
Moving on to the Super Nintendo now. The games run quite well, and the buttons are bound correctly. It handles Mode 7 without any issues. But here's a favourite, Mega Man X. And yeah, this sounds completely off. If you want this working at the correct speed, we need to change out the ROM. We added Yoshi's Island to the microSD. While it is playable, the frame rate is not stable. Enduro Racer. It's Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the second Mega Drive. For the Mega Drive, the buttons are bound correctly, but like before, some games are just completely off. Other than that, Mega Drive runs quite well on this little handheld. Onto the PC Engine now, here's Turrican. We can see that the animation is not smooth, it's like it's skipping frames. Disappointing. Moving on to the handhelds, here's Wario Blast on the Game Boy. On both the Game Boy and the Game Boy Color, the games do run fine, but are stretched to run much wider than we'd like. For Game Boy Advance, the emulation is not very accurate, with glitches, or some games not even booting up. While the text is sharp and easy to read, the aspect ratio is off again, giving us abnormally tall graphics. Sonic the Hedgehog 1 on the Game Gear. And Metal Slug on the Neo Geo Pocket. And here's the Wonders 1. Brum, brum. Vertical games are nice to have, but if you check out my hands, I'm not very comfortable here. If you open up the menu, we can turn Tate mode off. Piece of cake. We're glad to see that Hadoukens are easy to pull off, but button mapping is completely wrong. No one can play Street Fighter like this. Thankfully, the shooters still play well. Here's Giga Wing. Some Neo Geo now. As expected, this plays great. Unless, that is, you want to play King of Fighters. Games like this need a way to remap the buttons, because right now, it's completely off. Robocop. How many have rolled out a few updates to their firmware? It's roughly 1GB and quickly installs onto our microSD. Our audio delay problem with Tekken 3 still hasn't been fixed, but various video options for the Game Boy, Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance have been added. We have an aspect ratio fix, 1 to 1, and overlay that adds a bezel to the screen. While the Game Boy range gets video fixes, other systems that have problems are still left untouched. Luckily, custom firmware is available. It's called Garlic OS by Black Seraph, and it's heavily inspired by Miu Mini's custom firmware. There's RetroArch on the main menu. We can exit the game and continue precisely where we left off. As we have RetroArch, we can change video options, so integer scaling is possible. And we can change the buttons, as well as add our own cores. Audio latency for Tekken 3 on the PlayStation has been fixed, and now more systems have been included, such as the Commodore Amiga, but unfortunately some systems run slow as we currently don't have the hardware accelerated video drivers. So what is good about this device? Well, quite a lot to be honest, but the main draw is that it's a cheap handheld that has a simple, timeless design. But this is let down by its poor software and micro SD card. Again, it looks like Ambinit will rely on custom firmware to sell the unit, and the end user will also have to pay extra for a reliable micro SD card. At its price point, the Ambinic RG35XX sits well against the competition. We can only give this a solid recommendation once Garlic OS matures with hardware accelerated graphics. Until then, we still recommend grabbing the MiU Mini, or if you fancy paying a few extra bones, the 353V. As we finish up, 
Here's a big thank you to anyone still watching, and of course, to everyone on our Patreon. Thank you. We make video reviews, guides, and also fix cheap arcade boxes and the A500 Mini. If you want to support our work, please consider jumping on or clicking that like, subscribe, and bell. Subscribe this shizzle McNuggets with ketchup. This has been Amy Chicken of Team Pandory, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra!